it's it's a great pleasure to welcome you to uh, to the first um, virtual version of the uh, 3IE and LRDC seminar series. <clears throat> um, today we've got uh, Callum Davy from LSHDM uh, who will uh, present results from a review of, of how to uh, learn more from evaluations. Um, Callum is a assistant professor at LSHTM uh, and is one of the deputy directors at uh, LSHTM Centre for Evaluation. Uh, he has mostly worked on evaluations of complex interventions uh, with various levels of behavioural components. Um, I think I'm, I'm not going to say much more before uh, I'm handing over to Callum, uh, apart from uh, that we're going to try and keep this to an hour. Um, and, and I think Callum will, uh, will try to, uh, to monitor and take questions as we go. And, and I will also help out with that. Um, and, and also in, in terms of, of some housekeeping, when, when um, Callum is speaking, please make sure everyone that you're on, on mute. I can see from the chat that, that some of you are having problems hearing me and, and I hope that the audio is, is better as I pass on to Callum. Hi everybody. Um, so this is Callum. And at the moment, I can see the chat window and I can also see the Q&A window. Um, I think if there are still problems with um, the sound, please let us know. And, um, <clears throat> and then questions as you go along, I think can either go in, it, it can go in either, but probably given that the functionality is there, if you have questions as we go along, stick them in the Q&A. Um, and as I say, the plan is to um, keep this um, short so that we have time at the end um, and finish up in an hour. So um, this, the title of my talk is uh, Don't Let the Magician Distract You with Tricks, Designing Evaluations to Inform Action in New Settings. And the, and the basis of most of what I'm going to talk about is a um, review that I did in collaboration with multiple co-authors, who I'll talk about in a second, um, for the Center of, Ex of Excellence for Development, Impact and Learning, which is funded by um, the Department for International Development. So the problem that we were facing is that we're all hearing all the time that we need to use evidence. Um, but a lot of problems that are quite prevalent in the world are very case specific. So these could be issues um, relating to peace or um, <clears throat> uh, sort of one-off sort of historical events that we would like to use evidence for, but probably haven't seen exactly the same thing happen uh, in the past. And then the other problem is that, you know, often we see the same problem time and again uh, in many different contexts, such as traffic accidents, um, but we know the contexts are very variable from one place to the next. So how do we use evidence um, for, for those places? So the aim of this review was to suggest ways to learn more from evaluations of complex interventions to better inform uh, policy. Um, and uh, DFID also gave us some examples that we could think about uh, as we go through of the types of things where we think that it's quite difficult to, to learn with the current methods. Uh, so, for example, how do we best learn from a large scale multi component initiatives to improve education systems in, in, in a country? Um, or how do we learn from the response to Ebola in West Africa for future outbreaks? So, we're currently going through one, uh, for example. Um, or just generally about how health promotion can be reconciled quickly with cultural norms and expectations, which were uh, issues that uh, were faced during that epidemic. Um, what can we learn from a peace process such as in Northern Ireland that can be applicable in South Sudan, or, or perhaps we could say it could be applicable now um, in the modern uh, Ireland, island of Ireland uh, as they face new challenges relating to Brexit. Uh, and what can we learn about mobile phone technologies and how they're used to change behaviours, both for the implementation of future uh, 
for our phone-based interventions, but uh, also as a platform for understanding how habits can be changed efficiently. And uh, on top of those example, those four examples, I just want to introduce you to another example, which is um, of a evaluation I worked on, which I think is helpful because it's a little bit more concrete, and I'll come back to it at the end. So this was um, an intervention to try and improve the uh, HIV-related health outcomes of sex workers in Zimbabwe. The intervention was an improved version of an existing program called the Sisters Program, a nationwide um, long-term project uh, providing uh, sex worker uh, specific care for HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, the improved version was going to include on-site antiretroviral therapy, which was new, uh, and also uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is um, medicine that women without HIV can use to prevent uh, acquiring HIV. And the improved version was also going to have some additional community support to hopefully strengthen the implementation. There's a cluster randomized trial that happened across the country in 14 sites with half getting intervention and half not. And the intervention, of course, has a theory of change. And the theory of change looked like this. It kind of set up this idea that there were two sides of this problem for getting women to use these um, uh, biomedical interventions effectively. Uh, there, was a, there was a demand creation issue about making sure that um, everything was perceived as being acceptable and that women wanted to use these things. And then on the other hand, um, making sure that there was a strong supply of uh, the um, medicines uh, available at the time and place that they need, are needed and also um, that there's sufficient support to, for them to be used properly. So this uh, graph shows basically the result of the trial. We compared uh, the two arms in terms of um, you know essentially four different main outcomes and these if you're familiar with HIV will you'll see that this is essentially what is called the treatment cascade. So this is looking uh, across the whole population of women and saying how many of them are HIV positive, how many of those know that they're positive, how many of those are on antiretroviral therapy, and how many of those um, have uh, suppressed their viral load sufficiently so they're very unlikely to pass on the disease to somebody else, the, the virus to somebody else. And uh, this diagram shows how the levels of those outcomes changed over time between 2013 and 2016 for the two arms of the trial. And uh, you can see that uh, two things are apparent. One is that um, certainly in 2016, at least, the levels of these outcomes um, are all very high for sex workers in any country. So the prevalence of HIV is very high, but as are these po more sort of positive outcomes, as it were, um, the, the, you know, the steps in the treatment cascade. <clears throat> we can also see that things changed fairly steeply over time, especially in terms of these uh, uh, treatment cascade elements um, and that they changed pretty steeply in both the treatment and the control arms and that while what we what we kind of hoped would happen happened in the uh, treatment arm um, the same sort of thing happened in the control arm and so the results of this trial were more or less that there was no appreciable impact and uh, so we'll come back to this trial at the end but the question really that's sort of facing us now is well what do we what given given the sort of peculiarities of this context and the changes over time what can we take away from this and learn for um, new interventions happening in new places uh, hoping to improve the health of uh, sex workers so the review was done by uh, a very a varied and um, multidisciplinary uh, list of co-authors uh, who you can see pictures of here with their uh, disciplines from uh, you know, philosophy to uh, anthropology and um, lots of representation for public health. Uh, the methods that we used were, were quite sort of, I guess, like rapid and uh, they were probably, um, probably wouldn't cut the mustard for a, <laughs> for a three IE review for, for, for sure, but there was, this was more of a sort of theoretical review uh, looking at methods and um, so we, we, did a, we did a consultation with uh, the Centre for Evaluation at the school. We talked to DFID staff and um, the intellectual leadership team at uh, SEDL was um, you know, most of the co-authors and, and we talked to others as well. Uh, we reviewed uh, 57 uh, methods papers that were recommended by various uh, authors and other experts. 
and we use backward citation to find uh, other relevant uh, source material for methods for learning more from evaluations. And we're, there's an ongoing forward citation and more sort of formal review uh, that's under uh, undergoing right now. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about next is the essentially the results of this review process and this consultation with various experts from lots of different disciplines about how do you learn from evaluations of complex interventions. And I should say that some of what I'm going to talk about feels a little bit philosophical and uh, that's not a coincidence. I think a lot of what we're uh, we learned uh, came from Nancy, um, who is a philosopher, and uh, and I'm not a philosopher, so I'm gonna. I've tried to make things as understandable as I as I can, but um, hopefully you'll see when we get to the end and start applying some of it to some examples, it'll maybe be clear. So the next section I'm going to cover basically four parts, um, and this these uh, four parts relate to different uh, things that were covered in the review. So the first part is, what is it that we're learning about? So the key idea uh, here, which was that, that came out in the review, was about the importance of, and actually the centrality of, the idea of effects as depending on context. So we often hear this idea that interventions effects depend on context. That's like a sort of throwaway thing that people say all the time. You sort of, there's a strong sense that that must be the case, of course. But what our review showed and the consultation was that this idea really needs to be taken to its logical conclusion. So we can see how this problem, uh, how this causes a problem when we think about a tension that there is in the literature between this idea of fidelity of form versus adaptation. So one suggested way of making sure that the um, intervention effects that we observed in one place should be uh, seen somewhere else is to try and keep the intervention as similar as possible every time that you do it. So to really tightly manualize everything and to make sure that there's no variability and, it's, and that maybe it's the variability in the um, <clears throat> delivery of the intervention that causes differences. But on the other hand, we know that things need to be adapted to context, needs cultural adaptation and need to be changed so that it's you know, uh, possible to even implement things. And that tension more or less leads to this con this idea of fidelity of form breaking. It's very difficult to imagine with complex interventions ever keeping everything exactly the same. Instead, it's probably better to think in terms of fidelity of function in systems. So to think that the interventions that we're delivering are part of and are interrupting or, or engaging with complex systems that involve mostly social relationships, but also sort of structural relationships and historical relationships and that what we might want to try and maintain if we can is the sort of the function that the intervention is having in the, in the system. And this brings us to a, a sort of contrast that Nancy, I think, um, has explained elsewhere and, and is very helpful, which is the distinction between the intervention centered and context centered thinking. Now, I'll just talk through an example first before coming back to what that means. So we've heard a little bit in the news probably um, about the there's some excitement about the possibility that chloroquine, which is a widely available and quite cheap um, medicine, might improve outcomes for people with COVID-19 disease. Now, I don't know a lot about this, but I, as far as I understand it, this um, is not supposed to be an effect like bleach or soap, where the chloroquine interacts with the, uh, the, with the, with the proteins of the virus and sort of break it down as, in, a, in a sort of uh, in that that kind of way, it, you wouldn't this 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 effect of getting rid of the SARS-CoV-2 virus wouldn't necessarily happen if you just sort of mixed the two together in a petri dish. But instead, it's about the way that the cell is structured and the fact that chloroquine interrupts um, a particular cellular response to the invasion from the virus, um, and by interrupting that response it makes it harder for the virus to uh, replicate. And so even in something as simple in a way, with a simple intervention as, as chloroquine, um, the, there is a black box. And to a greater or lesser extent through biology and other things, um, we can understand what that black box is um, in terms of uh, the cell structure and the, and the genetics and all the processes that we understand. But in the ways, in all the ways that we mean when we say that interventions depend on context, even something like this uh, depends on uh, the, 
the, the place where it's being introduced. So you can go as far as to say that interventions don't have effects. The effect is not, as Nancy would say, sort of in chloroquine. It's an effect that's afforded by the context in which the uh, intervention is introduced, which means that interventions cannot work as a kind of general sense. They, it's, not a, it's not a feature of the intervention to always work. They can only have work. That's all we can really say of something that we've looked at. But we can hope to say that something works. But when we do, what we mean is that the context that afford the effects are common or identifiable. So if chloroquine through randomized controlled trials is shown to be uh, effective at reducing complications from COVID-19, then we might say that it works and use that kind of general uh, sense of the word because we think that it's um, uh, true of most human bodies because this feature of the cells is um, uh, very generable, generalizable. And then it may be that through genetic analysis and other things, we might be able to identify the specific context in which we say that it works uh, while it's not others we don't, but that's what we mean. And because complex interventions all differ and depend on context in complicated ways, um, the intervention is not really the, it's not the object, the primary object about which we can generate generalizable knowledge. Um, for most complex interventions that we are evaluating, it's not meaningful really to say that we've learned something about it itself. So what is it that we can say we can learn about when we do evaluations? That brings us on to part two, which is about mechanisms. So the idea of like mechanisms and theory comes, it comes up in lots of different uh, areas, lots of different um, disciplines. So one that you might have heard of is the realist evaluators talk about context mechanism outcome configurations. Uh, an idea that comes from a philosopher is um, the idea of Elster's mechanisms. And uh, for those he kind of refers to uh, sort of more colloquial things that maybe some of us are familiar with. Um, so for example, the phrase out of sight, out of mind as being a sort of mechanism by which that sort of says a sort of explains a kind of tendency for when uh, people who are in a relationship spend time apart, then they maybe start to grow apart. Um, but then he also says that the trouble with some of these mechanisms is that they're, they're, they often have a counterpoint, which is equally plausible, which is absence makes the heart grow fonder. I'm supposed to say fonder, not finder, sorry. Um, and uh, one of the challenges of this mechanisms research uh, way of thinking is to think about when does one apply and when does another, which I'll come to in the next slide. Uh, so another language that gets sort of used to refer to this type of thinking is middle range theory or MRT on the slide anyway. And uh, the middle range part of middle range theory is, is sort of trying to say a few things, but one of them is certainly the idea that um, there is in social science um, there is there is theory, uh, and you know in the structuration theory in social science in um, sociology, uh, there's sort of supply and demand setting prices in in uh, in economics and so on. But then there are these theories that are more um, maybe directly applicable and um, more practical. So ideas like role conflict, which is that when people have lots of stuff, lots of different things to do, they don't do any of them very well. Um, you know, the tendency to cooperate that people have a tendency towards cooperation given the right context or statements such as entrepreneurs tend not to expand jobs if the available workers have been employed for a long period and have lost skills. These are uh, statements which are not general theories. They're not grand um, social theories, but they're at the same time not, um, they're, sort of, they're sort of in the form of these type of tendencies that you might have. And then the other word, area where you hear the word theory used quite often is in program theory. And these are kind of context specific descriptions of how you expect the program to work in this particular place. They're normally completely novel, depending on for each program as it's implemented, even um, programs which are implemented, often they get adapted slightly and often there's a slightly different theory each, each time. <clears throat> and I think a really important thing to notice is that um, they are not sub theories of middle range theory. In fact, instead, they're normally derived from more than one middle range theory. Uh, so is middle range theory the solution then? Is this what we can learn about? Well, that is also a bit challenging because 
a middle range theory, as I said, can't handle the whole of a program. It can't explain the whole thing. Um, I'll show you an example in a second of what, why this is, but it means that um, we can't sort of say that the program just is one of um, or a part of a mid range theory. Actually, there are many theories being drawn on for any one complex program. And relatedly, the, if there are lots of causal changes, if there are many steps involved in the program between the inputs and the, out, and the ultimate aims of, and the out, impacts, then the mid-range theory, because of this kind of uh, tendency to be quite small and, uh, and, uh, and kind of modest, I guess, in what they, they claim to explain, um, they can't explain the sort of long causal chains from the beginning to the end of the program. And you can sort of see an example here. So this is a, a hopefully an example of a, of, a, of a program theory that is familiar to a lot of people. This is the idea that if healthcare workers visit schools in, so for example, rural Kenya, then they give children, uh, young children, uh, pills that reduce worm burden, then illness uh, could be reduced and weight gained, which could increase school attendance uh, and subsequently increase academic attainment. So this is clearly a complex uh, intervention because there's a lot of steps here. It might be quite linear, but there's a lot, a lot going on. And the program is essentially a manifestation of various theories. And you could say that each of these arrows actually is representing some kind of mechanism. The mechanism, for example, that goes between reducing illness and increasing school attendance. But of course, that itself, whether or not reducing illness is going to improve school attendance depends very much on the context and the support factors. So we need to think about how those things all interrelate uh, and figure out in the sense that realists talk about the context mechanism outcome configurations that bring about the relationship between uh, a, cor a correspondence between reducing illness and uh, increasing school attendance. Which means that mechanisms to some degree uh, also depend on uh, the context. Okay. So context matters for mechanisms too. And in fact, in some respects, understanding the mechanism is understanding the context. So when Elster says out of sight, out of mind, but absence makes the heart grow fonder, we can say, well, the context matters. So there's another phrase that says, the wind blows out the candle but fans up a fire. So that the idea of being there relating to relationships is to say that, you know, a small, uh, if, you're, if you're apart, but the relationship has, has only just begun, then maybe it, it will sort of fizzle out because out of sight, out of mind. But if the uh, relationship is strong, then um, the absence will make the heart grow fonder because the wind will fan up the fire. Really important aspects of the context will be things like why are the outcomes happening in the first place and then the support factors for the intervention being delivered. And we could think about this in another way, which I think is really helpful, which is to think about what doctors do in diagnosis. So if a doctor sees somebody who's ill, they, they don't go in and sort of try and map out everything about the thing that's wrong with the person and try and, um, you know, run a whole battery of tests. They start by trying to find markers for the contexts where the interventions that they have to choose from will be effective. So for a doctor, the interventions are drugs and other treatments, and the doctor wants to choose the drug or treatment that's going to be effective. And to know whether it's going to be effective or not, they need to know why the outcome's happening and then the support factors for delivering the drug. So they might start with, try with trying to work out why is it happening, and they'll look at various, um, uh, uh, various markers or, or sort of minimum indicators to tell what's going on. So if somebody was short of breath, wasted and pale, they might look for other signs and symptoms. They might ask about a persistent cough. Uh, they may, if they think they need to rule out something else, they might do a culture to try and figure out uh, what the problem is. And then they might look and ask about other, about support factors before they choose the intervention um, in terms of whether or not the person has sufficient food um, or whether they have other comorbidities. And then they might look at the wider sort of like population co context. Um, so for example, uh, while there's a COVID-19 epidemic going on, they may make different decisions about what to do next um, than if there hadn't been. 
So, so far we've covered like, what is it that we're able to learn about? And I've argued that what we learn about is about the mechanisms. And then talked about how some, sometimes mechanisms themselves are challenging because they don't explain everything uh, and they also depend on context. So what evaluations, what, what can we do when we do evaluations so we learn more about these theories and these mechanisms? So in, this is one, what we came across when we did our review. So we essentially came across three main ideas. So the first is to test theories, not interventions, to orient evaluation to accumulate knowledge that refines theory rather than testing the effects of interventions. And uh, I'll talk about that more in a sec. The second is to have integrated mixed methods process evaluations. Um, so process evaluations involve gathering data on multiple elements, the components of the intervention, the implementation, the mediators and the mechanisms and the effects of the context. Um, have issues to do with the representativeness of the samples for other people. Um, they've been thinking about risk factors for the problems and features of the target place. And uh, they're learning about the practitioner experiences of delivering the intervention. And I, I'm not going to say anything more about mixed methods process evaluation. I, I assume that uh, anyone who's following a 3IE seminar series probably already knows about uh, the importance of uh, mixed methods in evaluation. And then the third is the idea of leveraging heterogeneity. So this is um, two things, basically, conducting multi-site and pragmatic trials, um, and then using case studies. I'll talk about both of those in a minute. So testing theory. So one of the, this, as I said, one of the main ideas that came out about how evaluations can help improve learning for elsewhere is that we should focus more on the theory and the mechanisms and perhaps a little less on whether or not the intervention works. Because like I said, the feature that intervention works is not something that is transferable to other contexts uh, in, in most cases when we're talking about complex evaluations. Um, and the trouble is, is that there's a bit of a tension between testing theory and what works. And, uh, and some of the sort of design decisions that we make and the context where we work, you know, the sort of social context that we work in, the funding context, means that we have to kind of strike a balance between these two, ten these two positions. So the first problem is that um, implementations aren't very necessarily very good tests of uh, theories. So we could have some, could have lots of great ideas about theory and mechanisms that we think are really important to understand, but the interventions that we get to test are the ones that are being done. And uh, sometimes those aren't the best ways of doing the testing. Uh, and sometimes when we, you know, are coming up with interventions we, you know, we, that we're doing evaluations of, we, you know, we want them to work. So it's a bit difficult because we want things to work for the participants of our pro programs and projects. And so we have to kind of think against ourselves if we're also thinking about wanting to um, uh, test the theories. So Chris, uh, one of our colleagues, Chris Bernal, uh, one of the co-authors, sorry, he uh, had an example from a trial that he's finished recently uh, looking at a bullying reduction intervention in schools in England. And, uh, you know, they wanted to test theory as well as to know what works. Um, and uh, in doing so, they, you know, they felt, they found that because of the context of where they were doing the, the intervention, the, the, the type of intervention that it was and the difficulties of working in English schools, all their analyses were, you know, quite underpowered, uh, weren't as precise as they would like to have been. Um, and where they did sort of mediator analysis to try and figure out the pathways and the mechanisms by which the intervention worked. Um, those mediator analyses will, you know, be liable to confounding uh, because of how mediator analysis works. And it's difficult to solve that in the context of a cluster randomized trial. So another really good way of looking at this um, comes, or, or at least the statement of this position, you know, test theory comes from Rachel Glenister um, and the the j uh, group. Uh, so I'll just read out this quote from um, uh, one of her uh, papers. So she, she talks about the j framework begins with the question, what is the disaggregated theory behind the program? Where theory is described as ways of simplifying the world to make, help make and test predictions. The framework then focuses on the local conditions and whether the theory is likely to apply. The evidence available to support the behavior change underpinning the intervention theory and considers the evidence that the program can actually be implemented in this setting. With reference to cases from various contexts, the authors are, argue that superficial context differences might not be important when mechanisms travel, 
and that learning about theory will require synthesis methods that interrogate the mechanisms behind his intervention. So I think that covers like a lot of what I'm trying to say in this uh, talk. I think that if there is a if there's a difference, I think it's that um, the uh, the sort of economic context uh, and some of the interventions being um, tested have a sort of they, maybe they're a bit simpler and have uh, are, are possibly kind of captured within um, you know a single disaggregated theory. While um, the trouble with a lot of evaluations of complex evaluate, complex interventions of many with many parts is that there are lots of theories going on inside of it and so maybe some parts will um, be likely to work well and some people won't. Okay so a couple of questions come in. Um, so how would you test include the assumptions in theory-based approach and how do we test whether the theory is likely to apply in local conditions? So those are both uh, good questions. I think they're quite similar. Um, they're about asking whether or not, you know, how can you know whether the theory is going to be suitable? Uh, and I, you know, and I don't, I th I'm sure that um, Rachel goes on to explain that. But I think in what I'm trying to say is that um, the, the theory and the context uh, are not really distinguishable in a sense. Um, that what we're what we're really saying about whether the theory will work in the context is um, is saying whether or not is is looking and knowing whether the context is likely to be the right context for um, our mechanisms. And so, like I said, I think a nice way of thinking about it is a bit like how doctors think about things when they're doing diagnoses. So they have to think: Will this TB medicine medicine will this make this person better? And they need to figure out as quickly as possible whether, so their theory is set essentially on some level that um, uh, the medicine makes people better. Uh, they don't know for sure that it's going to make this person better. They're making a prediction, but they then find markers, which as I mentioned are various diagnostic tools to try and figure out if this person is likely to respond to um, the, the treatment. And, uh, and that's how they try and whittle it down. But it's, but the thing is, is, and I'll talk about this in a second, is that what doctors have done, which is probably better than we have done in the sort of development public health sector, is that they've really invested in that process of figuring out what to do. So I think the question is, how do we know whether the theory is likely to apply is, uh, I'll get to more, really the heart of the problem. So thanks for that question. So this, sorry, I'll just have a drink of water. So the second idea from, about how we can make our evaluations stronger for uh, supporting learning for elsewhere uh, that I'll talk about now is the, is the idea of leveraging heterogeneity. So as I mentioned, there's sort of more or less like two or three ways of uh, doing this or thinking about this. So one of them is to think about uh, what are referred as causal case studies. So in a lot of the evaluations that we're doing and the sort of modern evaluation um, paradigms, I think, you know, we're often doing randomized controlled trials or large scale quantitative comparative studies of some sort. And uh, this idea is basically a call for at least more focus on uh, or balance with um, using case studies or within case uh, causal analysis. So this means looking at uh, what uh, some people, what Woodcock refers to as the sort of causal density, trying to like understand from looking at what's going on in a place, um, how one thing has led to another thing, which is a little bit like process tracing, I suppose, um, and could also be similar to looking at the sort of symptoms and side effects of the intervention working that we would expect to see um, if it was working to build a, to build a sort of narrative um, that we, we think we understand what's going on. And this is essentially drawing on the sort of small n um, methods that you hear hear about in other cases. Um, so those ca causal case studies could be in places where things appear to have gone quite well, or in places where people think not not gone so well, and then have some sort of comparative process. Um, that could be supported by doing multi-site trials. So I think there's a tendency when you're trying to reduce the variability between units and so on. If we're designing an evaluation or a cluster randomized trial, you want people and places to be as similar as possible. Um, but there is a call for the purposes of learning about theory to actually build in as much heterogeneity as you possibly can. 
so to be doing trials uh, in multiple sites with the same interventions or for sort of sampling for difference. So rather than looking for lots of the similar places to include in the trial, to be explicitly trying to find the places that are most extreme on the um, contextual measures that you think might be important for determining uh, whether the mechanisms are effective or not. And um, <clears throat> another idea that comes up quite a bit is this idea of um, pragmatic evaluation. So this is evaluations of things as they're done in, in real life. And I think that uh, raises a sort of tension. Um, on the one hand, there's a, there's a sense that you can learn a lot from a pragmatic evaluation, you know, by pairing up with a, with a, a government or an NGO and evaluating a, a program as delivered in, in real life, in real practice, without any kind of interference from any scientists or academics. But then on the other hand, um, they can be more difficult for testing theory uh, when things are quite uncontrolled and uh, there's, it's harder to kind of like pinpoint uh, so sort of the mechanisms that are going on when, when, it's, when it's a little bit messy and difficult to figure out. So I would say that from that, our feeling was that you just need to be sure that you've got a very, very clear uh, and uh, accepted theory of change about how the intervention is going to work. And then you can figure out which bits of the mechanisms you're going to look at in detail. So the last part I'm going to talk about is um, looking to the magician. So the final uh, idea that we talked about in the in the review was uh, looking to the left of the theory of change. So just as a reminder, um, most things don't work in the sense that you can't say that uh, just because something worked once, it's going to work elsewhere. Don't work in the sense that when we do evaluations, I think Howard White often says something like 80% of uh, programs uh, don't appear to uh, have any impact. And contexts vary a lot. And so the a question I think that came up is, uh, when things don't work, are we looking in the right place? Uh, and part of the thinking about this idea came from while I was working at a organization called the Education Endowment Foundation. So the Education Endowment Foundation has run uh, over a hundred and, I don't know, many, many, many cluster randomized control trials of educational interventions in England. And the vast majority of the um, effects are, are, are null. The interventions uh, didn't work. And uh, I suppose the more I thought about it, the more I started to wonder, is that because these interventions can never work? Or is there something going on in the, is, I mean, this is, it wasn't a criticism of the EEF, but it was just a question to us in general was about, was there something going on about the way that the EEF is choosing the uh, interventions that should be delivered and which, and which schools they're delivered in, that means that they're just not matching up the contexts which need the, those interventions with the interventions that they've got. So to sort of illustrate this, you can imagine you've got this, you know, classic kind of theory of change. This is what like a theory of change looks like, right? But on the left of that, there is this design process. There's a bunch of decisions that have gone into making that theory of change, that theory of change. And, and also making that theory of change, the theory of change that is being applied in the context. And this is where I feel like the magician is. I feel like the uh, intervention and everything that goes on is, is kind of like the trick. There's a lot happening and we can focus on that and get a bit lost. But in the meantime, there's a bunch of decision, go decision making going on behind all of that, local, you know, using local information about contextual factors um, to make decisions about what we then do. And that, in, that we actually know very little about the, those processes. And we know very little often about the evidence for each step um, in the in, um, theory of change in terms of um, mechanisms. Often these things are just drawn in as arrows and, uh, and not really explained. So we could ask, how did this theory of change, this intervention get applied here in the first place? Uh, and, why, and why is it that we always think of the intervention as starting after the design is finished rather than including the design? So to give you an example, there is such a thing as adaptive design, where in a sense, the intervention is the way of responding to the context. So the, that could be a sort of formative um, process, or it could be a democratic process. So to put this in sort of diagrammatic sense, you could say that the intervention is everything in the yellow box. It's the drawing on the evidence and it's the 
learning from the context and then bringing that to the, the process that turns that into activities. And we want to think about, well, how are those things actually done? So there are a couple of examples of how this has been tried. Um, so one example that I often come back to is um, for is the use of uh, structured women's groups in uh, many countries now in the world, but it started in uh, Nepal and India. And um, these groups bring together women uh, in local contexts, and then they go through a semi-structured um, process of identifying uh, problems that in their local community that relate to maternal and child health, and then coming up with solutions to those problems, implementing those solutions, and then reviewing them. And uh, the point is, is that this is a sort of meta intervention. It's an intervention. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an intervention which is another way. It's a way of designing local action. Um, it's not about coming up with like things to do. It's not like sort of some traditional interventions, which, you know, come up with what you want to do, you know, build wells or build schools or, uh, you know, do a particular type of training for healthcare workers or something, and then do that everywhere. It's uh, building in this uh, local adaptivity uh, from the beginning and essentially evaluating that. Um, another idea, um, another case of this is from adaptive management. So this is a very popular um, idea in the business world or agile management you know it's I think basically what everybody is using now and a similar sort of idea which is that the, the approach to the management the, pro the approach to the project management is 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 the adaptivity is the idea of starting having having fast feedback loops having all the right people involved so that your decisions are made in a timely fashion um, but then moving with the context rather than coming up with a plan in advance um, implementing it as planned and then looking at after at the end to see whether or not it uh, it was uh, achieved on time and so on. So we can return to this uh, example that I raised at the beginning, this cluster randomized trial, and think about how some of the some of the things I've mentioned would relate. So, in terms of thinking about mechanisms, you know, there's a lot going on in this uh, trial. It was quite complicated, but we we could say focus in on just this first mechanism here. We could ask, what, what, if, what could we really learn about this me the mechanism that is, the, is shown with this arrow essentially between greater service demand, acceptability and peer support leading to PrEP and ARBs effectively accessed with support by sex workers. So we could ask, um, uh, Damien, I'll come back to your question at the end I think that's all right just because I'll just try and whiz to the end of the session and then and then I'll come back to that thank you um, so we could ask in doing you know in doing our evaluations we could start with the question what can we learn about this mechanism and the context personal structural social uh, where this mechanism is functional and we could do that in various ways we might do some mediation analysis using quantitative data try and figure out how things are working we could use case studies in areas uh, where you know, uptake was higher or where uptake was uh, less high and contrasting them. But we would also want to be drawing on theories from sociology and psychology, uh, which we'd be, we would be using our data to, to strengthen. And then what was the basis of the intervention in the first place? You know, I use this example partly because I'm convinced that the people who designed this intervention couldn't have been better informed about what to do. Uh, there were modelers, there were people with decades of experience of working with sex workers in Zimbabwe. Uh, there were all sorts of people who, um, and, and, you know, who, knew, who knew as much as they possibly could about what should be done. Uh, and then also the intervention was based on some formative research and some qualitative interviews and everything that you could possibly think you should do. So what I'm saying here with a, is not a criticism, but it's just a question. Have we learned enough about the basis of this intervention in the first place, um, about what evidence was used and how? Is that reported as you know in in a in the way that we'd want to see? And have we been able to learn from that process so that next time we design an intervention, it's it's more more locally appropriate? So in summary, um, what we learned when we did this review is that it's hard to learn about interventions. Complex interventions are very difficult to learn about 
Interventions are based on theories and evaluations can help learn about them for use next time. We need to embrace heterogeneity and not fear theory in our evaluations. And we need to think about how to learn about how we design interventions. So just a quick comment of, on the sort of criticism perhaps of what we, what we concluded. Um, someone might say, what, well, more science, uh, you know, a bunch of scientists would say this, a bunch of academics would say what we need is more theory, more thinking and all this kind of stuff. And I think there are some ideas from the sociology of science which would support that criticism. They would say that, you know, science hasn't always worked very well in the form of writing things down, coming up with these theories and diagrams and everything. But a lot of what science, how knowledge works is uh, through people, uh, through people getting to know one another and so on. And there's at least one example I know of, of a project trying to um, help cross fertilize learning from China and Tanzania on how to improve maternal and child health outcomes. Um, that's doing so by bringing practitioners from both of those contexts together to work together um, and to learn about each other's practices um, up close. Uh, and, I, and I don't think that that necessarily refutes this idea of wanting to um, use learning about mechanisms as a way of uh, sharing ideas, but it maybe just raises some questions about how we go about that uh, and what we mean uh, when, we, uh, when we say the, uh, what, um, what we, where we want the, the, the knowledge essentially to, to, to exist. Thank you for listening. So before we go to any other questions, I'm just going to uh, address um, Damien's question. So I think there might be questions coming through in chat as well. Oh, thank you. Um, so Damien asks, how do you compare this adaptive approach to community-based participatory research where the community is involved identifying the problem needs intervention in the way it's implemented? Right, so that's a really good question. So. What I think that um, we need, and I'm hopefully going to do, is uh, we need to think about what, what is the evidence that each of these things works. So what you are saying is that, you know, there are other ways of doing this. For example, a community-based participatory approach. And I don't disagree with you. Uh, I think that a lot of the time when we evaluate um, interventions on a large scale, uh, it's harder to build in those adaptive approaches um, unless you basically are upfront about the adaptive approach being the intervention itself. So I think if you if you were going about doing an evaluation of a program where, like you're saying, the the participatory the, the the sort of adaptive approach essentially is the intervention, then yeah, I think you'd be basically saying the same thing as what I was saying. A minute ago about the women's groups which is that the intervention is the design process uh, so no i don't think there's any real difference i think the question i have and i i don't know the answer and hopefully we'll be trying to find the answer soon or is what what is the evidence for which of these pro approaches actually work the best um so the women's groups uh, have been trialed many 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 times and have shown to be you know extremely effective um, but they often result in quite different responses. Um, you know, what women actually think they need to do in each place is quite variable. So it, it sort of really supports this idea that, you know, coming in with like a single prescription for how to reduce maternal and child health in all of these villages wouldn't have worked that well. Uh, but building in this like layer, layer of adapt adaptation um, was key to, to as, you know, that diagram sort of bringing together context and um, activity, uh, context with evidence to uh, generate activities. Um, okay. So are there any other? Oh, no, there are. Sorry, I just didn't scroll down. Yeah, so somebody asked for the slides. Yeah, I think the recording will be um, made 
uh, available. Somebody asks, has the rapid review been published? Yes, so if you go to the, the SEDL website and go to Inception Reports, you can find uh, our uh, paper. Um, so somebody's asked about the work coming out of the Netherlands on the transferability of functions. You didn't say much about this aspect. Could you say more? So, so I, 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 you know, so I think we need to drill down a little bit more because this was the review was done quite rapidly. But I think we could probably find a lot of um, similarity between notions such as transferability of functions and context mechanism outcome configurations. I think they're probably really quite similar, um, and they, as I say, sort of suffer from the same issue, which is that you can say, well. Um, you know, the, what, what we want is for the function to transfer. But then, as I said, like, even functions also depend on context. So you, it's, it's always, it's, you know, it's always about understanding the kind of relationship between the context, the mechanisms and the interventions together that kind of gives you something that you can change. Um, so like I said, I think, yeah, we've, uh, so I saw the, you know, this literature from the Dutch guys and, um, yeah, I think it's a very similar idea, the transferability of function. Um, but we talk about in the review about how the, the sort of just stating we should transfer the functions is not enough because we talk about a couple of examples where, you know, you think you know what the function is and you expect the function to apply somewhere else, but actually that function doesn't then lead to the change in the outcomes because the outcomes were happening for something else or because the, you know, the um, support factors are not there or so on. Um, context change theory true today it may not be true five years later. For example, women's groups are collapsing with neoliberal microfinance. Uh, the theory that groups work for women empowering is collapsing. Yeah, so I think that's so. Th so this is a point that's you know been raised a few times, um, which is this idea that um, uh, you know, contexts change in time and place. And I think that's right. And I think that's why, you know, I'm pro I probably slipped up, but I'm trying to, trying to avoid this idea of saying like, you know, this works. I probably did say that women's groups work and probably shouldn't have done um, because even, even they might not uh, always work as things uh, change. Can these approaches be applied to ex post evaluation? Uh, well, I mean, it sort of depends. Um, so ex post evaluation is where you, you know, you, you're coming in to evaluate at the end. And, you know, it's very variable whether or not you, uh, what you can do in those situations. So sometimes it might be that there's quite a lot of data available from throughout and the, uh, the, the, part, the delivery partner has collected loads of data. Um, so you can use that to try and yeah, tease apart these ideas for sure. And you can do interviews and it depends on how long the intervention has taken and how, um, sort of salient the key mechanisms are to people you can interview, for example. Um, so I think that's a difficult question to answer. I think it's always better to be able to work from the start and go through, uh, but, um, but not totally essential, it depends. So Marie, how would you incorporate adaptive management while protecting integrity of parties, for example, uh, where you have control? So, so I think that's, that's this sort of like, that's this sort of conceptual switch, I suppose, is, you know, when, um, uh, when they did trials of the women's groups, which I, th which I sort of think of as a sort of an adaptive management thing, a, a sort of a, a type of adaptive management in a way. Uh, when they did that, they, yeah, they did basically tell, set up a bunch of groups in, you know, 30 villages and then compared outcomes between those 30 villages and the other 30 villages. And you're right that they sort of didn't, they basically didn't control what the women's groups went on and did. And that was in fact, sort of the point. Uh, and I think like, you know, to some extent we're used to this. Uh, I think when we do clinical trials, I think we assume that we, we are in control, but actually not really. Like once the pill has gone into the person's mouth, you don't control anything after that. The, the person's body is then going to do with that medicine, whatever they're going to do. And if you look at the results of most cancer drug trials, for example, the majority of people don't benefit. Um, so there's vast variability between people who benefit and people who don't, and we don't really know why. So different bodies are doing different things clearly with this medicine. Uh, 
Uh, and so, but the best we can do is to uh, learn about what happens when we add the medicine. And we just have to hope that the medicine um, is as good as it can be. And I think it's sort of similar with this issue about women's groups. It's sort of saying, well, you know, you can't control everything, um, but at least we can be fairly definite about what the women's group is. Uh, and then maybe we can apply it elsewhere. But as somebody mentioned before, you know, you, you still have the women's group is also a self context dependent. So you never kind of like completely break out of this problem of having to think about things in terms of context. Joanna, I'm interested in what this means for evaluating quality improvement approaches. Unlike women's group, there isn't strong evidence behind this. Um, yeah, so quality improvement approaches. Yeah, so I think you're right that yeah, quality improvement approaches, if they are implemented in a similar sort of way, like basically relying on people to bring together um, information and evidence in a, in a, in a sort of, it's like, a, an, it's like an approach. Um, then yeah, I think that it would be useful to learn more about it. And I don't think we should like throw out our tools for evaluation, you know, straight away, you know, randomized control trials have been really powerful for evaluating women's groups. Maybe we need to do randomized control trials of other approaches for designing interventions, whether that's formative research or quality improvement processes or, or whatever else. Um, comparing one approach with another approach perhaps. Um, but then at the same time, you know, obviously a lot of these things rely very heavily on having a mixed method evaluation at the same time. Um, sorry, John, I'm just going to jump over because there seem to be a lot of questions in the question in the chat bit as well. Um, Damien says, another consideration is the way we measure what works if we are considering the adaptive process as part of the intervention. In this case, we'll be measuring much more than hard endpoints, but process that I'm not sure will have effectively drilled down. Um, well, I'm not sure that I understand that question. You might have to rewrite it. Um, Oh no, they're, they're actually more in the Q&A panel. Oh no, <laughs> sorry, I'm running out of time, I'm afraid. Um, so I'll go with Michaela's question and then I might have to pick up the other ones later on after this. Um, when you say that things might not work in one context versus another, do you have good ways to explain that to practitioners? Many practitioners tend to see evidence of an intervention working in small locations and believe that it must work no matter what in other locations. When we as researchers find that evidence don't work, it can be quite a back. <laughs> yes, uh, find it be quite a backlash. Yeah, I mean, I, I I do think that we there's a lot of. I, I can't say that there's a it's an easy solution. I think we're all existing, and you know, people who work in NGOs and government offices and stuff are exceptionally um, working under uh, funding and kind of even self perception constraints, which require degrees of optimism that I think academics don't um, feel or like feel under pressure to have. So, you know, I know a lot of academics who, you know, don't feel that embarrassed about saying that they've done lots of trials that don't work. Um, and uh, that's true because we're not really, uh, we're not massively incentivized to th find things that work, at least not in public health. I think that's a bit less true in other places. Uh, whereas in the, you know, in the NGO sector and so on, you know, they're just under a huge amount of pressure to be optimistic. Uh, and I think trying to foster, a, you know, a level of communication which can create a safe enough environment to talk about why what they believe might be might, might just not be true uh, and uh, you know that predicting the future is really really hard um, and finding you know case studies like that one I just described where you know some of the best smartest people in the world smartest people I know certainly came up with an intervention for Zimbabwe and you know it didn't work <laughs> uh, you know, I think is a, is, a, is, a, is a good motivating case for anybody else to look at it and say, ah, okay, well, you know, why should I believe I'm any different? You know, it, it, it clearly just is quite hard. Okay, so I'm afraid we're at 1.30 and I, d I don't want to go over an hour because um, well, I said I wouldn't. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I... Um, haven't caught to all the questions, I'm afraid. And I don't know how easily I could just carry on. I think what I'll do is I'll just 
stop. Um, and if, if people have questions, you're very welcome to send me an email uh, and then we can maybe pick it up there. But anyway, I just want to say thank you very much for listening uh, and um, for all your great questions. Great. Thank you so much, Callum, and uh, thanks for all of you attending and, and uh, staying. I think that indicates that uh, you've uh, uh, you really engaged your uh, virtual audience, Callum, so, so thanks for that. Um, we, we hope to announce the, the next um, uh, presentation in, in our virtual seminar series over the next couple of weeks, so please um, uh, check the, the 3 AE website for, um, for an announcement there. Um, so thanks again, and uh, have, have a nice rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.